you very, very much, um, Alex. And just in case there's anybody standing around, there are still a couple of seats if you want to come up. Um, don't be shy about that. Um, when it comes to the scale of the climate challenge and the transition to net zero, it's very, very easy to swing, as I often do, between extremes of both pessimism and optimism. But our first keynote speaker, uh, who is one of the world's leading climate conversationalists and the founder of the incredible Cleaning Up podcast, he is not losing heart. At least not yet, I don't think so. Um, he is an acknowledged um, thought leader um, on clean energy, mobility, technology, climate, sustainability, and the all important issue of finance. Michael Liebreich thinks that Ireland is an interesting bellwether for the world when it comes to the transition to net zero. So I'll be interested to hear why he thinks that. I am going to have a chance to interrogate Michael briefly on your behalf after his keynote speech. So please get your comments, your observations, really tough questions for Michael in through the slide up and I'll try and fa uh, facilitate as much them to them. But without further ado, we're delighted, Michael, that you could join us here today in Dublin. Michael Liebreich, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. It's an honour and a pleasure, as always, to be here. Um, I, have been, I have been at um, IIEA ESB events before, uh, they just get bigger and bigger. So that's part of the acceleration is that our community, this community does seem to also accelerate in, uh, in scale. So um, let me try and use this time to put in perspective, I am not the biggest expert by a long way, by a long shot on uh, Ireland's trajectory towards net zero, uh, around its economy, its politics and so on. I'm not here to talk about that, but I will try and locate the journey that you're on in what is happening globally. And as Derville said, you know, you can be enormously heartened, you can also get quite depressed, and you can do that all within the space of uh, just reading a couple of different news stories. So, where are we overall? If you look at the 2020s so far, it has been tumultuous on a scale that really no, maybe those who remember the 1970s can remember, but actually it's been even more tumultuous than the oil crisis uh, of the 1970s. That was an oil crisis. This has been a, an everything crisis. They call it a poly crisis. And so if you go back to 2020, that was before Glasgow COP21, where everybody, Ireland included, committed to net zero, or two thirds of the world, the developed world committed to net zero by 2050, and 90% of the world's economy committed to net zero by 2070. That was only a few years ago. And then, of course, we had COVID, the incredible inflationary price spike, which defined the first few years for the energy sector uh, in, of the 2020s. Uh, that is now starting to, uh, has been receding, but then we've got this appalling war on Ukraine by Russia. Um, so very tumultuous, but there is clearly a great clean energy acceleration. And here you see it in numbers. Um, there'll be a PDF version of this, so you don't need to take photos or jot down figures. Um, but we're at the point now where each year there's just under $2 trillion invested globally in the transition. And that is essentially, if you add together the supply side of energy, and a lot of it is going to be electricity more and more, you add the demand side, the changes that have to be made to the economy to absorb that, and then also the distribution grid. Um, if you go back a few years, that was not included. These are numbers from Bloomberg NEF. But you know, when I started what is now Bloomberg NEF, the information company, in 2004, that figure was just $36 billion, $33 billion. So an incredible growth in investment, and one can definitely be heartened by that. This is serious money. In fact, when I came um, the first time to an IIEA event, it was 2012, and this film, The Social um, Network, had just come out. And it contained the, the line, you know, um, uh, you know, a million isn't cool, you know, what's cool, a billion. And, um, and I riffed off it because at the time, that investment figure was about a quarter of a trillion. It was 240 billion. And what I said is, you know, a billion is not cool. If you want a transition, you have to talk trillions. 
trillions, T, trillions. So now we're talking trillions. We're nearly at two trillion. But then you start reading the news, and you see things like you know, China, tremendous, incredible uh, boom, but then also you read that the wind industry is uh, in incredible trouble and uh, is in, in crisis. Um, you see uh, there's a slowdown in electric cars. We read all about the slowdown. Is it there in the data? Because the other thing is you see this incredible surge of cheap EVs coming out of China. So China has gone from fifth or sixth place in global uh, vehicle exports to number one in three years. So is that a sl what's slowing down? What's speeding up? It's really hard to get a signal from the noise. Um, heat pumps, they, they're surging. In the EU, they've tripled in six years. The US, you've got more heat pumps being sold than furnaces, but then you get Heat pumps hit a slump. Is it a temporary slump? Is it a real slump? So we have to be data driven. And what I try to do, um, I still write for Bloomberg. Um, I have no other role, but I write for them. And I wrote these two pieces to try to sort of make the bull case the bear case, right? The, the, and I call them the five horsemen of the transition, the things that make it almost inconceivable that we'll get to net zero. And then I wrote, the five superheroes, the things that actually make it inevitable that we will get to net zero. So we start with some of the sort of bad news things. And the first problem is actually cost. Wind is cheap, solar is cheap, batteries are cheap, EVs are cheap. But that's only a small part of the challenge. How cheap is it when you need to keep the lights on when it's not windy or sunny? How cheap is it when you're in the global south and your interest rate that you pay on a wind farm is not 6% or 5% like it is in Germany or Holland, but it's 15% in South Africa and credit is unavailable in other global south countries effectively. And even if you look at here in Ireland at Let's call it high temperature industrial heat, because that's a, you know, that, there's a piece of demand which is just around, not, it's not going to yield to heat pumps, it's above 200 degrees. You're just at the moment using gas. And gas, for most of the time, ignore the spike, that will go away, but for most of the time, we're talking about 30 euros per megawatt hour to use gas for heat. Now you want to use electricity, because we can make electricity clean. As Alex has laid out, electricity is going to be clean, and we're going to electrify a lot more. But it's going to cost more. Look at that, 233 euros per megawatt hour wholesale price for a business. And then we can do hydrogen, right? But we now know hydrogen is not going to be one euro per kilo. In fact, it might be seven euros for the next decade or the forthcoming years. And then it costs 178 euros. And even if you get really cheap hydrogen, it's still more expensive than gas. And so clearly, we've got a problem. This is not going to change quickly. We are going to need carbon prices, and that's great. We're in Europe. We're going to have carbon prices. What are they going to have in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Indonesia, all of Africa. And Africa right now, whatever it is, around a billion people, is going to be 2 billion people by 2050 and 4 billion by 2100. Are they going to have a carbon price? Or are they just going to use what they've got, which is gas? The grid. We're going to electrify everything. Fabulous. That's going to take a lot more electricity. The electricity isn't going to come from thermal plants along the, around the coast. It's going to come from offshore. It's going to come from deserts around the world. So you've got more electricity coming from new places. And because wind and solar are variable, sometimes you need it from over there, and sometimes you need it from over there. So you're going to have to build redundant transmission, more electricity from different places with redundancy. The grid 
that we have to build is going to more than double all the grid that we've got in the world today. All the way to the sun and part of the way back. And when I say double it, more than double it in the world, think about Africa, where they're starting from such a low base. Really? Is that really going to happen? And then minerals. We all know that an EV, an electric car, uses six times the minerals of an internal combustion car, huge amounts of whether it's rare earths or whether it's copper or nickel and, of course, lithium. And the last of my horsemen of the transition apocalypse was that there are people who are actively trying to slow it down. The fourth horseman was that there's inertia. Not everybody is as engaged as this crowd. This is what we do for a living. There's inertia, political, social. But the fifth horseman was that there are actually people trying to talk this down, trying to put a spanner in the works. So in the UK, this is an example, the Energy Utilities Alliance, which sounds like it should worry about energy and utilities, it's the Gas Heating Lobby Group. And they were caught last year, their PR company was boasting of a campaign to spark outrage about heat pumps. To spark outrage about one of the major solutions that we need on this transition. Now, that's the five horsemen, the costs, the transmission, critical minerals, inertia, and bad people trying to slow it down, predatory delay, merchants of doubt, to use the phrase from Naomi Oreskes. And it's pretty depressing. So I'll move on to the superheroes. The reason why, and I come down on the side of the superheroes. I'll, Derbal, I'll give you the answer. I'll give, I come down on the side of the superheroes. Now, does that mean we will reach net zero by 2050 easily? Absolutely not. In fact, it means we won't reach it globally by 2050. But it does mean that if you're looking at 2070, something like that, which if you go back to the Glasgow commitments, is what the, uh, you know, India 2070, China 2060, if you look at the global transition, could we do it by 2070? Yes. And the superheroes say that we've got a very good chance of delivering that. When I started New Energy Finance, I founded it in 2004. And it took a whole year to install one gigawatt of solar power. I'm looking to my translator because I love to know, I'd love to be able to say gigawatt in sign language myself. Can we give our translator a round of applause? So, six years later, it took one month to install a gigawatt. A gigawatt, by the way, you know, it's kind of like one big power station, one big coal power station would be a gigawatt. Of course, if it's solar, you know, it only works 20% of the time and so on. So just to get an idea of, of the scale, okay? So we were installing, six years later, we, the planet, world economy, one gigawatt in a month. Six years later, one gigawatt in a week. And in 2023, one gigawatt per day. So it's hard not to be encouraged by that. If you look at it in terms of some of the, the overall numbers, the green line at the bottom, that is modern renewables. That's wind and solar. There's a little bit of biomass and so on. Not hydro. Hydro is the blue line. That is the, yes, the blue line. That was when I started New Energy Finance. That's 20 years ago. And that's where we are now. I say it's hard not to be heartened by that. Now, that is... The green line is 15% of all electricity in the world that's now being produced by technologies when I started New Energy Finance were less than 1%. Now, this is clearly some sort of a penetration curve. Right? Clean energy, renewables, penetrating into and pushing out the other forms of electricity. 
And there's a key point here, which I, I call it the sneeze, because when you talk about these, the economists call them logistics curves, and it's log, log, this, and there's endless papers. I talk about the sneeze. Why? Because when you start below 1%, it, it, this stuff fundamentally doesn't work, and the only people installing it are kind of a bit mad, and they're you know, very tree-hugging, and there's no service, there's no finance, it's very difficult. You go through that 1%, and the thing starts to cusp upwards, and it feels like, to those who understand what's happening, it feels like waiting for a sneeze. It feels like it is inevitable that it will suddenly take off, it will be explosive, it will be disruptive. And when you reach that sort of 5% point, I think that's where you really kind of break into the mainstream. That's the sneeze. That's when some of the incumbents get into trouble. When you start to see the big restructurings, when you disrupt the electricity markets because your form of electricity has no variable cost and appears when it wants to and not when it's necessarily most useful. So the sneeze is the point that really kind of hits the radar screens of the mainstream. And you can see it was around 2013 when wind and solar became really cheap. And everybody understood the things that we had been talking about and that I came here in 2012 to say how cheap wind would be, that, that started to really get into the mainstream around that time. Now, in Dubai, Sultan al-Jaba, CEO of the oil company, but also president of the, um, uh, of the COP meeting. Uh, it was an incredible achievement. We're going to transition away from fossil fuels. And he talked about um, tripling renewable energy. But we are actually already on track without any more policy for renewables to grow by two and a half times by 2030 no new policies. Again, it's difficult not to be heartened. Now, what happens is, because of all these renewables, you see electricity prices going negative. It's very disruptive, very, very disruptive. Um, and of course, until recently, it was going to be the age of gas. Fracking in the US, in fact, they're going to frack everywhere they tried. But what we see is that batteries are doing the same thing. The costs are coming down. And now, if you're building a peaking plant for gas and it's only going to work in the evenings, you probably go with batteries instead. The second superhero, though, is system solutions. A lot of people who don't understand the electricity markets, they say, ah, oh, the renewables, it won't work because you don't have enough batteries. We'll never have enough batteries. We will never have enough batteries. If your model is every wind farm you build, we've got to have a month worth of batteries. And by the way, that's what's driving the horsemen of the apocalypse around minerals are models that have been done by people who think that every solar farm and every wind farm has to have four weeks of battery backup. Utter rubbish. The solution is a system solution. It's demand response, it's interconnections, it's a bit of overcapacity of the renewables. And these two complementary technologies. Why are they complementary? Because you can charge the car when you want to, or when the electricity is free, or even negative cost. And the same with thermal storage is much, much cheaper than battery storage. And so we see EV sales. The sneeze happened during COVID. There is not a slowdown. There is a bunch of Western car companies that have messed up their model cycle. And they can't sell the cars that they're marketing because they neither have a big enough battery to avoid range anxiety, nor are they cheap enough to sell to everybody. And you know what? China is stepping in. And the car companies will have to respond if they want to continue to exist. Charging, people worry about charging infrastructure. The analogy that I draw is this was the first piece of video that ever appeared on the internet. And this is what the internet looks like 20 years later. It's about investment, 
charging will be ubiquitous the same way that Wi-Fi is now ubiquitous. Heat pumps, at chew, you get used to the picture. But that then leaves the hard to abate sectors. And one of the superheroes, the third one is, there are no hard to abate sectors anymore. When I first came here, 2012, you look at steel and cement and, and aviation, and we thought, you know, those are gonna be really tough. They might cost a thousand euros per ton carbon price to deal with those. Now, we see pathways to each of those sectors. 150 euros, 200 euro carbon price. There's lots of different options. Some of them, in fact, have even yielded and might not even cost a carbon price at all. And the reason why we've had so much innovation, so much investment, is because we are in an age of great power rivalry. Climate is a global problem, and so it's natural to think we must have a global solution. When Sputnik was put into space, the first satellite, that was not a cooperative effort by the US and by the Soviet Union. It was a competitive outcome. First person in space, first person on the moon. Com competitive. So the US Inflation Reduction Act, and now all over the world, everybody has to respond, and money and talent is flowing into the hard to abate, and it turns out they're not that hard. They're still hard, but they're not 1,000 euros per ton hard. I, I'm gonna, there's a disappearing demand, the fourth, uh, I, we, I haven't got time to go into all of them equally. Um, people worry about the inflationary impact of this transition, driving up the costs, but at the same time, we're taking out demand in the economy for engineers going into oil and gas, for steel to go into pipelines, for ships. 40% of ships on the seas, on the high seas, are actually transporting oil, gas, and coal. Okay, so disappearing demand, but then there's this one, primary energy, we've seen this chart thousands of times. The challenge is too big, and only fossil fuels can deal with it. Well, no. I'll give you the example of an LED light switching from incandescent powered by coal to an LED powered by solar. 95% reduction in primary energy. Another example, switch from an internal combustion car to an EV. 75% reduction in primary energy demand. It's called primary energy demand because it's got nothing to do with demand. It's how we choose, historically, how we've chosen to supply that demand. And then heating, move to a heat pump, 75% reduction. So electrification of vehicles, electrification of heat, those are our secret weapons. All the debate, everybody wants to talk about the last 5%, the last 10%. Why don't we talk about the next 50%, which is going to come from Transport, heat, and industry. Notice I'm not talking about agriculture, because I know that's really hard here. <laughs> so those are the five superheroes uh, of the transition. Exponential growth, system solutions, hard to abate sectors going away, disappearing demand, and primary energy fallacy. It wouldn't be right to leave without talking about hydrogen, though. So I'll give you a quick version. Some in the audience will, will know this stuff, but I'll give you a few minutes on hydrogen and then perhaps finish with some remarks on where Ireland sits in all of this. We all know that everybody, Germany, uh, this is uh, Japan, the US, you know, everybody talks about this, the Swiss Army knife, which is hydrogen. Swiss Army knife because it can do everything. Transport, power storage, chemical feedstock, aviation, everything. The analogy, which has been picked up even by people like Bill Gates, um, it's too good. Because you can do all sorts of things with a Swiss Army knife, the little scissors you can use to cut your hair, and the knife, you could put the butter on your bread with the knife, 
Um, and you've got that little saw, you could, you know, uh, when a tree falls on the road from the high winds, you can remove the branch. But there's almost always something cheaper, safer, more convenient. Cheaper, safer, more convenient. And that's the same with hydrogen. That's why it's such a good analogy. There's Bill Gates. I think, I'm, I'm, I'd like to think he'd heard of me using the analogy, but he's misunderstood it. It's a Swiss army knife in the sense that you won't use it unless it's cheaper, safer, more convenient. Swiss army knife, cheaper, safer, more convenient when it comes to taking the cork out of a bottle of wine on a camping trip. Otherwise, I don't use mine a lot. So when it comes to battery vehicles, there's the Achu, you've already seen that. Drawn to scale, hydrogen vehicles. Because they're not cheaper, safer, more convenient. But you know what? It's not just going to be cars. That's buses. It's extraordinary. Everywhere in the world, everybody wants to have a go with a hydrogen bus. They all come to the same conclusion. It's too expensive. It is not cheaper, safer, more convenient. That's trains. They are not cheaper, safer, more convenient. Fertilizers, and the issue here is the hydrogen price. If you can't make hydrogen for less than a couple of euros per kilo, then somebody has to pay the difference. The green premium is so big, and it's a showstopper for project after project after project. That's shipping. No hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, will be shipped. You can ship ammonia, but it's very inefficient to turn it back into electricity. Heating. People want to promote hydrogen heating. Luckily here, You've got a minister, whom we'll be hearing from, and I'll be in conversation with, who has said no hydrogen heating. In the UK, we talked about the predatory delay. The agents of predatory delay are still talking about hydrogen heating. Even though, per unit of heat, hydrogen is twice as expensive as fossil gas, even if it's blue, even if it's from fossil gas. They don't tell people that they're utility bill, they can switch to hydrogen, utility bill will double, and they don't tell people this, that if you want to be safe, you knock a hole in your wall, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and leave it open. The perfect heating solution, if you don't mind having a hole in your wall. And what's happening is, there's all of this hype about hydrogen, all of this talk, and of all the projects, 170 million tons a year of hydrogen, which would be a, almost a doubling of our current hydrogen use, 1% by volume is actually has had the decision to go ahead. It's a final investment decision. And the future, of, I'm afraid, for the next five or six years of hydrogen is projects disappearing, projects being shelved, projects being delayed, with about 5 or 10% maybe in the end going ahead. Anyway, I've got this hydrogen ladder, if you want to look it up, hydrogen ladder, which tries to summarize the use cases. I am not against hydrogen, right? I, there will be hydrogen. There is hydrogen in the economy today, fertilizers, petrochemicals. We may use it for steel, and here in Ireland, there's a really important discussion to be had about long-duration storage. You've got all the wind in the world, You've got all the biomass in the world, but how do you keep the lights on when the wind isn't blowing? Do you have enough biogas, biomass, or do you need to be storing some version of hydrogen? So, as I say, I'm the least expert in the room on this, the 2050 commitment by Ireland, but I want to put it in perspective. These are your energy-related CO2 emissions. They've peaked and they're coming down. You've done well. But to put it in context, that is, and this is per capita, so normalized per capita. I like the comparison with Denmark. Similar size, strong agricultural output, similar, maybe not quite as rainy as Ireland, but it's close. 
similar uh, climate. So there's Denmark and there's UK. Others have done better. And this is really why, if you look at GDP and CO2, and there's Ireland, the biggest difference between, you know, and you can do this not just for Denmark and UK, but you can go right across Europe. The big difference is your economy has grown. You've been so successful, it's very difficult to cut CO2 when you have an economic growth rate like China's or India's or Ireland's. And you're the only country in the EU that has really got this problem. So, the bad news is, congratulations, you've been too successful. The good news is, for all of the fractious nature of various discussions, for all the uncertainty, how are you going to accelerate? For all the stuff we're here to talk about, the good news is you have the resources to deal with this problem. It would be much harder if you had not been so successful. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, you can take a seat. We'll shortly see uh, what questions um, we're going to have uh, from the audience. But before we do that, I have one or two of my own. It was interesting that you mentioned Glasgow because the, um, the Scottish government is on the brink. Um, Humza Yousaf is uh, his entire political career is hanging in the balance, in part because the Greens capitulated at the Scottish government um, not meeting those targets, not committing to those after they scrapped essentially the climate targets. In context of what you have said, that maybe 2070, it's kind of fine. There's kind of a mixed messaging there, because obviously everyone's 2030, 2040, 2050. Is it okay? Because there is going to be a lot of tension uh, in politics and society about the targets. And I just thought it was interesting. The Scottish government has a lot of issues to contend with, not just uh, climate, but it was interesting that it was that issue that has led to the crisis for them. Yeah, I mean, I think at some point, if you've nailed your colours to the mast of 20, um, uh, net zero 2050 globally, which is you know, generally, you know, most countries have said 2050, but a lot of the financial community, a lot of investors, a lot of businesses, um, and the fact is, you know, globally, we're not going to be at net zero 2050. So there has to be a kind of realization at some point. And of course, what happens is the longer you leave it, the, the, the more improbable the curve looks to get to 2050. So I think overall, a large chunks of the economy are going to have to admit that, 20, that, you know, that, that, that they're not going to get there. And you see the oil companies have essentially had to do that. I think the situation in Scotland was also around, they had actually said 2040. So they've made that problem much, much worse. Um, and then had to, you know, ha had to admit that they're not going to get there. Um, we're also going to see some, a lot of problems around 2030. And by the way, the EU has stored up a world of pain with things like the renewable, what is it, the, the RFNBOs, the, um, the, the uh, fuels of a non-biological uh, origin. And there is no earthly way that they're going to hit those numbers. So I think this, this business of, of how do you communicate the fact that you're not going to hit. And of course, you know, for a while, you can say, we won't hit the near-term targets, but we'll still hit the 2050 targets. But there comes a point where it's like, no, sorry, you are so off track that it's no longer credible to say you're going to hit them. Um, so I don't want to say that Scotland is a postcard from the future, but Scotland is a potential postcard from the future. And from Scotland to Switzerland, when I last spoke to you, you were in Switzerland, and I see it's Swiss Army knives up, but actually the real climate knives have been wielded by a group of senior women, uh, the Senior Women for Climate, also known as the Swiss Grannies case. Uh, that recent uh, ruling, which really was so landmark, and it was interesting because the Irish government has taken quite a considerable amount of flack because it intervened in the case. And Minister Ryan, who will be with us here later, is saying, you know, that it's interesting in a country where strategic litigation has moved many, uh, many mountains. He's saying, well, look, you know, maybe the climate crisis can't be addressed through the courts, perhaps not solely through the courts, but it certainly has uh, thrown down the gauntlet, those women. 
So th this is the case where some, uh, they call it the Swiss grannies, they actually went through the legal system um, to say that it was it's illegal, that the, the government's plans were illegal because uh, uh, they were, they were uh, and I think they used sort of human rights law to say that the, yeah. that the rights it was were being their health. In, in, on, on health were being infringed. So there's things to like about that and there's things that, to dislike about it. The thing that I like about using the courts in that way is that we have got these um, targets, targets. Up the targets, and in a, in a way, to link it back to the last question, your last question, your first question, um, that you know we've got these targets, and there's no point having them if if we just sort of trundle along business as usual, with always this kind of hockey stick at the end saying, oh, it's all going to get, you know, you know, but we'll do it between 20, 2040 and 2050, we'll do everything, it'll be fine. That's not good enough. So I think that seeing the activist community switching from let's have more and more ambitious targets to let's see implementation is really important. That's to like about that. What I don't like about it is when you, if you um, use the courts as your mechanism, it almost by definition focuses the problem on those countries with the rule of law, strong courts who actually care about this stuff, which means that it's in a small minority, frankly, of the world's economy, population, uh, emissions, and so on. Another way of putting it is, why don't they go and try and do the same thing in China or India, or what is their approach to Africa? Because you know the, the challenge we've got is, uh, if we urbanize in the same way across Africa, and everybody, nobody wants to sleep in a house that's got a dirt floor rather than a house that's got a nice concrete and, and is uh, you know, habitable and so on. But what's their plan for the cement industry? What's their plan for the steel industry globally? And that has almost nothing to do with Europe and absolutely nothing to do with Switzerland in the grand scheme of things. So I worry about, and, and I, I worry about it also because it focuses on the developed world, it also hits the most innovative climate solutions providers hardest. You know, a lot of activists would love for Shell and, uh, and Chevron and Exxon to be out of business. Well, guess what? Then you end up with the same demand being met by Saudi Aramco, Petronas, Sinopec, and they will not be worrying about clean, um, clean petrochemicals or helping with our hydrogen. And certainly won't you know, be so worrying on. about uh, litigation. Um, can I ask you about Ireland? Just one of the last uh, messages you touched upon, which was part of um, you know our economic growth and our economic success story. Like I mean, we're at a very very interesting time on the island of Ireland. We are after a very very long period of time now finally back at pre-famine levels of population, anticipating huge um, population growth, um, huge demands. Um, for housing, uh, for other infrastructure. In that kind of horseman, superhero kind of balance, you know, that, that you tread, you know, how can we decouple or can we decouple the demands for economic growth on the one side and for a strong, healthy economy versus the, the emissions and the cost of meeting all of those demands? Well, so I, I, I think... First of all, you are decoupling, right? We saw the chart and you, you know, you've gone through the peak and your emissions are going down despite the fact that your wealth and your population and so on is going up. Um, so you can do it. The question is, can you do it faster? Yep. And you know, do you kind of run out? And I think one of the things I would encourage, and you know, this is a very engaged group of, you know, uh, a very influential group, don't spend all your time worrying about the last 10% because you can decarbonize all of land transportation, all of heating, and a whole chunk of industry in the next 10 years really fast. The technologies are here, the supply chains are here, the money is here, um, the, the, the talent is here. So, um, and, and when you talk about housing is very interesting because it's much harder, to renovate. the real problem is not can we build new housing because of growing population, because the new housing can be very low carbon and you know, zero carbon in use is not that hard to achieve. The more difficult thing is actually renovating your existing housing, where being wealthy really helps. And, and this is it, because you know, anyone who can put heat pumps in the home, who can retrofit their home, that, there is an essential question of privilege involved in that. And it's interesting, because there's a question, uh, just going to the questions from the floor, 
which speaks to something you're so passionate about, is where the balance lies between financing and funding to enable the transition, and what role should there, Seamus, thank you for this, should there be for government supports on behalf of the citizen? Because, you know, it's something you also write a lot about, pricing really, really matters, and, you know, for some, as I say, if you have an EV, if you, if you have heat pumps, th that is, in, in essence, a sign of your privilege. Well, I think, and I think I'd like to Although think, it is I, coming down, the costs I, are coming Exactly. Down. I do hope that we're on a cusp. I do hope we're at a point where the, the upfront cost of an EV should become lower than an internal combustion engine, because then, of course, everybody can participate in, you know, when, so uh, uh, first, I should say, it's, it's absolutely essential that the less well-off and the more vulnerable participate in this. Um, but just, just before you jump to, well, government has to make them whole, uh, and then it has to come out of taxes. There's an enormous amount more that can be done. Uh, and if we are on a cusp, there's a lot of, um, a lot of this will sort of sort itself out. Uh, if we, and you'll end up, you'll build lots of wind and you'll end up having those negative prices or zero prices of electricity for more and more hours of the year. And you have to make sure that even the poor and the vulnerable can benefit from those, but can, uh, not not just rich people with heat pumps, uh, you know. But, but also but at an investment and level, you know, th these are often long-term strategic assets. Yep. And you said we don't know which ones are going to win or lose. So they, I suppose the uh, the investment environment also has to be very stable, it, or at least supportive. It, yes, I mean, it, and uh, you know, you need to look after your credit rating and make sure that, that that it's cheap to borrow. But I just want to say something about heat pumps. There is a lot of there are a lot of fallacies about well, you can't do a heat pump until you've done you know new insulation, new windows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that pushes up the cost. That means a heat pump looks like a fifteen thousand euro investment, whereas a new boiler is very cheap. Of course, the boiler is not an option. So the question is really, heat pump or what? Mm. Heat pump or what? And in fact, heat pumps are now so good that they can, it used to be that you had to have, the heat pump only kind of worked, it only had a coefficient of performance of two or more if you could have the flow temperature at sort of 40 degrees, very low flow temperatures. That's not the case anymore. So. What used to be fabric first, first you have to insulate, first you have to put new windows in, first you have to make the place airtight. In many cases now, it's heat pump first. And so I think that from a policy perspective, and I know Paul Kenny and I know the minister, are, Ryan, they, they, they know a lot of this stuff. For a, it, we're now switching to an era of heat pump first, and then you've got a bit of time then to insulate and reduce the costs. So I think that we are going to see an acceleration, we're going to see the accelerate happen as that knowledge permeates the finance well, community and the, the well, various community groups. Uh, and we're talking about acceleration, but, and you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act, in terms of that, what's sort of been termed as the slobalization, um, you know, and that kind of the, you know, the different regions, you know, China, whether it's America with the Inflation Reduction Act, this kind of subsidies war, you know, concerns about uh, connectivity, pro productivity and innovation in Europe. So there's a question again here, are subsidies needed for these renewable technologies and to support uh, CFDs indefinitely? Is there a place for a, for, for a more free market approach when there is that, you know, what you mentioned, the age of the great power our rivalry, what impact do you think that's going to have? Well, so I'm a big fan of price signals. I mean, sort of politically, but also in clean energy, you know, we saw feed-in tariffs, right? Germany did feed-in tariffs, and that drove the initial few years of solar, particularly, but solar and wind. But it was enormously inefficient. Mm. Germany could have achieved the same by putting a reverse auctions and mandates from the government and they would have got the same volume and they would have got it at lower cost and nobody wants to talk about that. But what happened is the feed-in tariffs got, you know, they became widespread. But the moment that we started to move to reverse auctions and to get the price signals, that was the moment when the cost reductions that had been achieved by the European wind industry and the Chinese solar industry, they hit the market because of price signals. So I don't think you can say, we'll just take the subsidies away and you know, let the chips fall where they may and it'll all be okay. That is absolutely not going to happen. But there's a lot more that we can do to get price, time-based price signals, locational price signals, get them to consumers 
get them to consumers, and consumers are smart. They will figure out that if electricity is free 20% of the time, they will figure out Wait. that an EV is the right purchase for their next car. Could I ask you, there's another question here, um, just in a couple of minutes we've left, your top three things to accelerate the transition in this decade, what would you prioritize? Is this an Ireland question or a global no, question? No, this is your, your global question. Okay, so globally, I always say the first thing, if I had only one um, sort of... Magic wand. One, one, I only have one wish with a magic wand, I would want um, campaign reform in the US. Just a, a, a wee thing. Small thing, just one. Well, you gave me a yeah. magic wand, right? Yeah. I get to use it. I think... Um, is, is that because we're, we're witnessing the, the biggest, notwithstanding the Inflation Reduction Act, which has benefited a lot of uh, uh, red states and, and has really benefited innovation, is that because you're worried about the election cycle coming up and that the biggest backlash is there and those people who are desperately holding on, who see sort of fossil fuels as their birthright nearly, is it because of that? Well, it's, I think it's more than just, you know, the, the, I'm, I was astonished. I think there are relatively few surprises that I've had in 20 years of doing this, right? I was surprised by fracking, um, which exploded onto the scene. Um, I was surprised by, tragically, Fukushima. Nobody anticipated it. Was the, there was the nuclear renaissance, and then suddenly there wasn't. And I was surprised by um, Elon Musk. Well, not Elon Musk. I'm, everybody's surprised. I mean, I'm surprised by him every day to the negative. But... Um, Electric cars, uh, elect EVs, I, I had not, you know, I had not uh, switched on to that until 2009, 10, which it took a long time. Um, but, um, yeah, there's relatively, relatively few surprises in all of this. Does that but go back then to the communications piece yeah. that you identified at the beginning when you're speaking about campaign reform? Is it that, that battle for the hearts and minds? Yeah, so, it's, but, but, yeah, so, the, so the, the Inflation Re Reduction Act came out of nowhere it took four weeks from hearing about it to it going through. But the problem in, uh, you know, I, and I, maybe it's not, I shouldn't just locate it in the US, but the, but the US really, the, the, the oil and gas money is just so pervasive in, I mean, you would just call it corruption if it wasn't legal. It is technically legal, but it is not, uh, but it shouldn't be. And, and it is so powerful and the amplifier of the US in the world. And it's not just, you know, it, it, it's not just at the federal level or the state level, it's throughout. Um, so if you could neutralize that, that would do an enormous amount. Because, you know, I started New Energy Finance. I'm not an activist. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm not an activist. But just providing information accelerates. Just giving people good information. If you understand heat pumps, you want one. If you understand wind's going to get cheap, you want some, right? So good information, but, but having such a sort of large pollutant being paid for by other people. And by the way, I could also say if I had another wish, it would also be probably reduction of, of corruption elsewhere in the world, which includes then perhaps would deal with Russia as a bad actor in more ways than one. Um, and I would like to see the interest rate differential. I talked about South Africa, 15%, yeah. Europe, 6%. That differential, because if we don't shovel money productively, I don't mean shovel money as aid, we've done that, and, and, and it's limited, a couple of hundred billion a year. Trillions have to go to the global south, because what we do here in Ireland, you are 0.1% of global emissions. Um, and so, you know, you can have an outsized influence, but if we can't get investment at scale in the global south and across the developing world, more, more than just the south, so China and, and, and so on as well, if that doesn't happen, then we're not going to get to net zero. We are not. We are going to get to Michael Liebreich later on. Thank you very, very much for your uh, contributions uh, to the conversation. We will see you later, but for now, thank you very, very much, Michael. Thank you. All the best. Thanks, Andy. Talk to you later.